I am the only Richard Fairgray in the entire world, so I'm very easy to find. And I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that Lucy is one of a very few Lucy Camagnolos. So Google either of us, Google Shed Kickstarter. The um, Blue Fox Comics is run by Simon Burks. So if you see his name on there, that's the one. Jump on Twitter and follow Lucy or I there and keep up with that and, and every other thing we have going on. My goal is to be the world's most prolific comic artist. I think I'm on my way. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of rapid fire is simple, 11 questions, nine to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? Our guest today is a returning guest. Uh, you have not seen his actual interview yet because I'm still editing that stuff. Give me a freaking break already. But we are joined by the ever talented Richard Fairgray, who is a co-writer and artist of an amazing new comic called Shed. How are you doing today? I'm delighted. Um, so like a little, a little like behind the scenes for for the viewers. Like we are recording this on the day that the Kickstarter launched, and we funded in two and a half hours. So I'm kind of just elated living in that world uh, right now, and trying to focus on like my other work and my other books that I'm meant to be drawing 24 hours a goddamn day. <laughs> but instead, I'm just like kind of buzzing that this. I, I've never been on Kickstarter before either, so oh, this is all like wildly new to me. Well, now that you have the bug, you're going to have to start doing Kickstarter campaigns for all your comics now. It's just crazy how that happens. It's it's a little tempting. I emailed, I, I, I emailed, I'm not a thousand years old yet. I texted, like cool kids do, my manager this morning and said, like, this is how quickly it funded. And he was like, okay, cool. We're doing this for all the books from now on. I was like, oh, oh, are we? He's like, well, will you also exclusively do AI art from now on as well to be really hip. And I was like, no, I'm only going to do fan art of the film AI. And then I texted him 10 minutes later and said, fuck, I accidentally did fan art of Bicentennial Man. Uh, and then I had to spend like 30 minutes trying to explain to him what Bicentennial Man was because oh. somehow he missed that film. What? Yeah. It's time to get a new manager then in that case. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, that's that's classic Robin Williams. I mean, I, like, there's well, I don't, I don't know if anyone would look at that and be like, you know, what are the classic Robin Williams films and like put Bicentennial Man up there? So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to defend it super hard. I would say the classics are obviously Mrs. Doubtfire, yeah. Jack. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a, as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Often today, besides Robin Williams quotes and impressions. It is, yeah, it's mostly the Robin Williams stuff. I'm, I'm Richard Fairgray. I am a comic writer and artist and colorer and letterist, and colorist and letterer, and all the things that a person can be. I have 259 titles to my name at this point. I have been doing this for a very long time, originally in New Zealand, uh, but at 31, I dipped out of that scene and came to North America and started doing books over here. I did Blastosaurus, Black Sand Beach, Cardboardia, Ghost Ghost, a handful of things for anthologies, a handful of other things coming out over the next year and a half through different publishers. And for the first time ever, I'm with a publisher in the UK doing a graphic novel called Shed that I am very excited about. So what's the story behind Shed then? And how did you link up with this publisher? The, the bare bones of it are Shed is, a, is an atmospheric horror about a young woman, Amber, who moves to the small town, kind of looking for that happy ending that we all think we are meant to have. When you, according to television, move to a town by the sea, you date a couple of different people, it becomes all kind of messy and quirky and fun, and then you eventually settle on one of them and you have your happy life moving forward. Uh, and you probably get some kind of cute job at the end. So she thinks she's going to have this. She gets there. She discovers it's like a nightmarish small town where everyone is completely focused on this sea monster that used to be there that no one's seen for a very long time and a pier that used to bring in tourists, but no one comes anymore because the pier blew up. And the petty interpersonal politics of a group of old women who seem to run the entire place just kind of are like slowly dragging everyone into this mired pit of misery that is repressive, backwards, small-mindedness of the small town. All of this underscored, of course, by the fact that 
maybe there's a sea monster. So who is the publisher in the UK? Uh, so the publisher is, is Blue Fox Comics. Um, they are in Scotland. This all kind of came about. Lucy and I, uh, Lucy Campagnolo is my co-writer on this. We wrote Cardboardia together with Pixel and Ink. We used to live in the same country. We both lived in New Zealand. We both wrote together. We did a podcast together. We were, you know, inseparable. And then I moved to America. She moved to London. And then she was three months into trying to get like her dream job and kind of being offered her dream jobs in London when um, COVID happened. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it was a bad scene and everything went away. And I got trapped in LA and my husband was up in Canada and she was kind of stuck, unemployed in a tiny apartment in London. Neither of us had any real prospects for any of the things we were in the middle of doing. And so I said to her, like, let's write a new book. Let's do something. Let's like, maybe we do a screenplay. Maybe we do what like, we'll do something. And it became this big, messy, sprawling thing of like, I was working on a thing about how anyone who pretends they're looking for Bigfoot, it's all just to cover for secret gay sex in the woods, because that's what I would use it for. I didn't feel like drawing a hairy character because that takes a lot of time. So I was like, scrap that one. We worked on a whole thing about a theme park wedding. And then we kind of dipped away from that because it was like kind of too mean to some of our friends by accident. And we ended up writing this like big, messy story about the small town and then being like, we love the town, we hate the story. <laughs> what else can happen here? And at the time I was being, uh, I was booked in for a colonoscopy. And I was like, when I get my colonoscopy, I film it, we use the footage and we do a book, a, a picture book using colonoscopy footage as the background. This is a bad idea, by the way. I wanna be very clear. I'm aware this is a bad idea, but what would it look like if you were lost, if you woke up one day lost inside a sea monster? And the book was going to be entirely in the dark, finding your way through my colon to escape a sea monster. And Lucy said, that sucks, but I do want to do a book about a sea monster with you. And so we started on, on this book shed. At the time, one of the things that was like really keeping me sane was that Fanbase Press does a weekly comic creator zoom call for la comic creators it's literally the only contact i really had with the outside world and with you know without conventions and things i was not talking to any comic people lucy and i started like being on that call every week and through that we met simon burks who runs blue fox comics over in scotland and we were also at this point cardboardia book one was about to be released the distribution hadn't been figured out for the uk mm. And it was Lucy's first book, and I thought that it sucked butts that her first book wasn't going to be a thing that she could go out and find somewhere, you know? And I know COVID and she couldn't go out anyway, but like there's something really special to like the first time you see your book in a store window. And so me having this weird like romantic idea of being a writer and whatever, and like these important moments you should feel, I said, we need to get your a book by you in London somehow. <laughs> We should talk to Simon. He's over there. And we didn't really know him. And, you know, like he just kind of been on this call with a huge group of people. But I was like, let's give it a shot. And I ended up pitching like four different things to him. And he really loved Shed. I think at the time it was called Kitchen Sink. Kitchens, plural, incorporated. There was a, there, like a myriad of other titles for this thing because it was about ceramic fish. It was about ceramic cats. It was about collectible tins that came with wafer biscuits like it was a whole on mess shed became the thing we settled on before we wrote it but i pitched shed to him he loved it we'll do this with him we'll see how it goes because we're all going to be taking covid very seriously for about five or six years we think and no one will want to go outside before then so we're going to have a lot of time and then about four minutes later everyone was like we're fine let's go outside again and die by the time that four minutes had passed, I'd actually signed up for five different graphic novels with different publishers. <laughs> and so now I live in my house, not for lockdown reasons, but because I literally have to get the work done somehow. And this is the byproduct of that. This is this is one of the five books. Four of them are drawn. I'm working on the fifth one now. I have 102 pages left. I have to, I have to draw that and color it. And then I have to draw another 112 pages of the fourth Black Sand Beach and color that by the end of the year. So it's 109 days left in the year. Who needs sleep? Sleep, ah, that's, that's for the week. Besides the fact that 
this publisher was in in Scotland and in in the UK to to help support, of course, your your fellow co-writer find her first book there. What was it about this publisher that kind of spoke to you as as a creative person, and why did you decide to choose them? It was two things. I hate Lovecraft. Hmm. Uh, I find everything that Lovecraft does just unbearably dull in a way where I can kind of look at it and go, okay, technically, I guess this is, there's some good ideas here, but I do hate it. And it makes me really happy whenever anyone's like, hey, you know that Lovecraft, super duper racist and shitty? I'm like, yeah, let's talk about that part. Let's not focus on his dumb monsters that I hate. Let's talk about the shitty parts. Blue Fox, they do a lot of Lovecraft stories where they rework them to not have all of that shitty stuff in them. And I think that's pretty great because even though I hate everything Lovecraft does, uh, there's a lot of people out there who, who like him a lot. I don't agree with Neil Gaiman a lot in the world, but if you look up his thoughts on Lovecraft's writing, there's nothing I can say that's funnier than what he says. The tendency to write in the first person and to keep writing. The ultimate parodic Lovecraftian phrase is somebody going mad while writing and something's coming up. I can hear them now coming up the steps. Their hellish tentacles are squirming at the door. I are Shabnigarath, the beast with a thousand young. Fatang, fatang. And it's, you're done. Dot, dot, dot. You disappear in a, in a, in a burst of ellipses and italics. And I think that, that that sums up all my problems with them. But Blue Fox do good Lovecraft, which is amazing. And the other thing is that did a book called uh, Fishing Memories. It's a lovely book about, about dementia, about Alzheimer's, and it's heartbreakingly sad. And like, like any form of dementia is something that I find very heartbreakingly sad anyway, so it's like an easy get for me. This handled it so well. This beautiful poetic story about a man in his own mind searching for pomegranates to, so he can hold on to a piece of a memory for a second and then having to feed it to the thing inside his brain and losing it again. This is the kind of comic that it's a big risk to, to put out a book like this. It's not the sort of book that has an easy jump on point because it's about an old man and pomegranates and memory loss. I sort of looked at it and I thought like, you know, I do books about complicated, messy characters and a lot of them are about aggressively feminist characters and very flawed characters. And I do a lot of stories that can't really be summed up in a single sentence and Shed absolutely fits into that because it's about a young woman learning that her search for a happy ending is fundamentally flawed. Lucy and I try and write characters where the basis for it is we think, what does the character want and what does the character think they want? And then the drama of the story happens because of the disconnect between those two things. It makes them incredibly character-driven and incredibly relatable because you give the audience a way to understand both parts. Because we all know what it feels like when our friend wants something but doesn't know it. And so we try and write these characters so they'll feel like your friend who you want to scream at. And you want to say, no, get out of that small town. No, don't be friends with those horrible old women. No, just stand up for yourself. Don't sell her the fish. Pay attention. Yes, there's obviously a sea monster. And it, it felt like that was something that would be very hard to explain to an audience who weren't kind of prepared for it with things like with books like Fishing Memories and books like these more nuanced approaches to Lovecraft. Uh, and so Blue Fox just seemed like a very good fit for it. So what is it about Lucy that you enjoy working with, especially when it came to creating Shed? How does she balance you out? Lucy has um, a sort of driven optimism where she can look at any bad idea and see it as purely an idea. Uh, and I think this is really valuable with, with the writing process. So often one of us will say something to the other. That it'll be the stupidest thing we could think of. But the reason it was worth saying was because it had something in it that like we were connecting a dot. She's very good at seeing those dots. And I think I'm very good at seeing the same dots with her. We're, we're very in sync about that stuff. And so we're able to take the smallest idea and spin it into this like big complicated world. She used to work for me uh, at, at comic conventions back in New Zealand. She's had just like a real understanding of like middle grade fiction. When I started doing Carbordia, she was like my go-to person of like, 
what if we did this as a, a series of novels? And it later turned into a graphic novel and a whole blah, blah, blah. But writing with her on that, I would send like just a dumb joke, just some stupid pun about a character or some like deliberate misunderstanding of a fact about One Direction. She would email me back and be like, Richard, did you just deliberately assume that my cat was named after a One Direction fan theory, but also because you often confuse my father's name with my cat's name, you conflated those two and combined it with that time that you lost your iPad, uh, iPod at my house? Is that the joke you're doing? I'm like, yes, you've seen the 11 steps that I've taken on this journey, but you saw them. Every conversation with Lucy is me going, what? Oh, and her going, what? Oh, it's been an absolutely delightful process. And like, especially with Shed, like because it's gone in so many directions, having her, her perspective of like the expectations that are put on her as uh, a 32 year old woman and the expectations put on me as a 37 year old man who's basically been a disaster most of his life and like figuring out where those two things cross over like helps us find these strange angles to jump into a story from. You mentioned early in this interview that the campaign is completely funded in two and a half hours. It was two hours and 32 minutes. Not that I was obsessively watching. I want to be clear. I was obsessively watching so I could get screen grabs at 69 backers, 69%, $420, $666, and then $1,337 so I could post to Twitter, fucking leet. I'm a child, it turns out. I have work to do, and this is what I spent my morning on. Hey, those are valid numbers in every stretch of the imagination. I am 100% behind you on that, on those screenshots. This is why I would lose the prices right, by the way. I would just set everything at $420.69 and just stand there grinning. (laughs) Now that the campaign is funded, you're into stretch goal territories. You're into how many days left in the campaign, actually? 15 days. This was a very short campaign. What was the reasoning behind that? Well, so Blue Fox just do campaign after campaign. They fulfill Mm. incredibly quickly. Um, They tend to not run a campaign for a book that isn't already fully drawn and ready to go. I mean, this book will be printed and sent out uh, by December. So it's, it's, it's a really quick turnaround and everything. I think that like most likely they normally do 12 campaigns a year, I think. And I think this year they were probably like, we can do 13. Let's get another one in there. So why not? What has the reaction been, not only from the backers, but of course through social media that you've seen about not only the campaign, but of course, maybe some of the work inside of it? People have been like quite excited about it. The reviews that have been coming in have been very much focused on like how eerie it feels, which is really nice because I was worried that we were kind of like falling too far into kind of a quirky fun territory with it. And, you know, it is meant to be horror, but like a very subdued, just let's make everyone feel a little bit uncomfortable for as long as we possibly can type of horror, which is kind of my favorite types. No, the reaction has been incredibly good. Uh, People have been sharing it a lot and posting very positive things about it. The people who have read it so far are very excited by it, which is nice. I had to do this book kind of in between other books. um, And because six months in to the kind of writing process because we were just doing like one uh, one kind of morning every two weeks on that. Lucy ended up getting an actual dream job and uh, we got vaccinated and travel started happening and then I had to go to New Zealand and she had to go to New Zealand and it was uh, like nightmares were happening for her. And so I ended up drawing this book ch- one chapter at a time about every two months. And so it took a full year and then I finished it, I think back in March. This week, I've been looking at it for the first time since I finished it, it's wonderful. Like one, it feels like a book that I didn't do. Like it feels distant enough that that it's it's new to me. We really captured something pretty unique in the storytelling. For those that want to, of course, support yourself and of course this Kickstarter campaign for the next few weeks here, tell us how we can find you and how we can, of course, support the campaign itself. I am the only Richard Fairgray in the entire world, so I'm very easy to find. And I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that Lucy is one of a very few Lucy Camagnolos. So Google either of us, Google Shed Kickstarter. The um, Blue Fox Comics is run by Simon Burks. So if you see his name on there, that's the one. Jump on Twitter and follow Lucy or I there and keep up with that and, and every other thing we have going on. My goal is to be the world's most prolific comic artist. I think I'm on my way. I think you're, you're at least three quarters of the way there, aren't you? I'll, I'll have finished my 
78th page of comics today for the year. So far this year, I've already put out three graphic novels and a 12-issue series online. Three in print and then the 12-issue series online, which I will do something with in print later. But it was six pages a week until last week. And then, well, that series ended. And I don't know what to do with myself on a Wednesday morning now if I can't write a newsletter about it. Well, I, I'm sure something will crop up, uh, crop up in your, your schedule and uh, some idea will appear and you'll be back to fulfilling your Wednesday uh, quotas. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm, I'm doing this three hours of sleep a night thing now, so it's going well. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on this interview of Two Geeks Talking Rapid Fire. You can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.